Welcome to our lesson about adaptive components. Let's start by inserting parts. I'll browse to the folder where I've got my components, shift select and click open. Left click to place, right click and done. Part one is grounded as you can see from the tree. Click on the constrain command. Constraint type will be mate. Let's select this edge and this edge and click apply. Now this edge and this edge, apply. This edge here and this edge, apply. This edge and this edge and apply. Let's cancel out of the tool. In our last lesson, we saw how to create adaptive parts from scratch. In this lesson, we're going to learn about adding adaptivity to existing parts. Basically, what I want to do is this. I've got a hole right here. It's in all three parts. When I change the diameter of the hole on one of the parts, I want the diameter of the holes on the other parts to change automatically. So what we're going to do is change the diameter of the hole on the blue part, and then have the diameter of the holes on the fluorescent green and olive parts change automatically. Let's right click on Extrusion 2 and select Adaptive. The adaptive symbol appears next to both the feature and the sketch icons. Let's do the same for extrusion 2. Right click and select adaptive. Let's activate sketch 2 under extrusion 2. I'm going to convert the hole diameter into a driven dimension. Let's select the dimension and then click driven dimension on the format panel. When a dimension is a driven dimension rather than a driving dimension, it's a reference dimension. It doesn't control the diameter of the hole. If you prefer, you can simply delete the dimension as well. Let's finish this sketch and let's return to our assembly. Let's switch to modeling view in the browser. Let's do the same for sketch 2 in part 2. For this component, we'll simply delete the dimension. Just select and press delete on your keyboard. Let's finish the sketch and return to our assembly. Next thing to do is apply constraints. Activate the constraint command. Constraint type mate. And let's select other so we can get the face I need. There we go. And let's select this face as well. Click apply. Select other as well here this face, and this face, and apply. Let's cancel out of the tool. Okay, now we're ready to change the diameter of the hole on the blue part. Let's expand part one. Expand extrusion two. Double click on sketch two to activate it. And double click on the dimension to modify it. Let's change it to three quarters of an inch, okay. Finish the sketch and return to the assembly. As you see, the diameter of the holes in both of our other parts updated automatically. How it works is like this. The diameter of the hole in the blue part controls the diameter of the hole in the fluorescent green part, that's the part in the middle. Then the diameter of the hole in the fluorescent green part controls the diameter of the hole in the top part or the olive green part. In other words, the diameter of the hole in the blue part, part one, was changed first. Secondly, we change the diameter of the fluorescent green hole, and then the diameter of the hole in the olive green part was changed. We can do this in a slightly different way, where one dimension controls the other two dimensions simultaneously. Let's try that out. Let's begin by deleting mates 5 and 6. Let's activate the constraint tool. Mate type. Select other, and let's get this face here, and this face here. Apply. This face here, and this face. Apply, and cancel out of the tool. Now let's see what happens now. We'll change the diameter in part one. Let's change this dimension from 3 quarters of an inch to half an inch and click accept. And now we'll finish the sketch and return to the assembly. And as you can see, all holes have updated appropriately. 
The diameter of the hole in the blue part now controls the diameter of the holes in both of our other parts simultaneously and directly. The first step was that the diameter of the hole in the blue part changed, and as a second step, the diameter of the holes in the other parts changed simultaneously. Now performing the operation the second way that I've demonstrated here can potentially cause errors. In other words, in order to avoid some potential problems, it is better to apply changes to one part at a time, as we did in our first demonstration. If your assembly is complex, this method can simplify diagnosis and troubleshooting considerably. And this concludes our lesson about adaptive parts. In our next several lessons, we'll continue to explore the various types of constraints that we can use in Inventor during the assembly process.